Okay, let's get right to it. I have a lot of slides. I also will try to stick to my time. That's a good idea. So we're going to talk about Asian deer, primarily Asian deer and dry forests. And most of my work has been done in Southeast Asia. So that kind of colors everything I'm, I'm going to say here. But a lot of it holds for, for India also. And I, for most of you, you probably have some more expertise than I do in this, in this subject. So this is a conservation meeting. You know, there are different stages and different activities that happen during conservation. You know, I work at the science stage. I'm working on science and understanding. And you, I don't want to, you know, don't, before your head swell too much, that's probably the easiest part of conservation to work in. You know, most of the problems are happening in policy and management. Science can advise and then we kind of step away and the fights happen at that other stage. I just want to acknowledge that. So, you know, there's a lot of animals, a lot of plants out there. We're only one person or one group. We have to decide what we're going to do in this life. Why? What, how do you select the animal you're going to work on or the system you're going to work on? That's, um, it's not really all science. It's a combination of science and economics and preferences. I happen to work on deer and I work on deer in forests. Uh, that's my choice. Uh, why, why work on deer and why work on, in, in the case of tropical deer? Uh, first, you have to realize there's a lot of deer species out there. Uh, they're spread throughout the world except for Africa and Australia. We have a bunch of reintroductions in Australia. We won't talk about those. Uh, but we have all these species, and if you, you know, there's such a variety around the world, both in Asia and in the, in the New World. Uh, they come in many forms, shapes, and sizes. Uh, the problem is that more, about two thirds of them are at some level of endangerment. Uh, they taste good. They taste good, they eat crops, so they cause conflicts, and they're relatively easy to catch. And those are the criteria for becoming endangered. So it's easy to find a species to work on if you're, if you're concerned with conservation. I tried to do a little simple math thing. Uh, I took all those species of deer and I, I gave them a score from one to four, with one being least concerned and four being critically endangered. And then I compare temperate deer to tropical deer. The higher the score, the more endangered you are as a group. So tropical deer are more endangered than temperate or boreal deer. Grassland open forest deer are more endangered than forest deer. And large species are more endangered than, than small species. That DD are data deficient deer. We still have a lot of deer out there that we don't even know enough to tell you if they're endangered or not. So that's, a, that's an area for someone who wants to study. Again, I say, why? To read what some of the other people said, why study tigers and leopards? There's a bunch of animals out there we know nothing about. Make your mark on something new. So large tropical deer in open grassland forests, that's the place we want to go if we want to look for something that's in danger. You got plenty of that in Southern Asia. Trouble dry forest deer, elk deer, bear, singa, shambark deer, which is already extinct, so you missed that research project. Hob deer, sandbar, those are all species that we're concerned about in this area. And, you know, we've got our four or five species of munjack, and we have chittle. I'm, I'm still a little worried about all of those also, but my primary are those large, those large tropical deer. If you want to understand deer conservation, there's four critical factors for deer conservation. Habitat, 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 and protection. If you got no habitat, you got no deer. That that's it, eighty percent of it. And then the other twenty percent is you usually have to protect them to a certain degree. But you've got to conserve habitat. So what kind of habitat do we have? What kind of forest do we have? It's almost impossible to make a dry forest map. It just it's just a habitat type from remote sensing that is really hard to differentiate especially intact versus degraded dry forest. They look very much the same. So here's a, here's a forest map of, of, of this region. Uh, if you try to isolate the dry forest, dry forest is, is more than the green and less than the green plus blue. It comes out somewhere around in there. So, so we have still some relatively big patches of dry forest, especially here in India, but also in Thailand, 
in, in Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos. We have dry forests throughout the region, Sri Lanka. If we look at the deer species we, we were talking about, we're concerned about, they fall really into two or three groups. First are those riverine grassland specialists, Barasinga and hog deer. Uh, these are the, it's hard, the, the colors are bad here, but let's see if I can make this work. Uh, these, are, these are the current ranges of, the, of hog deer, and this is the current range of Barasinga. Uh, and Schomburgs was going to be in the, in the Bangkok area. Their, uh, their ranges are pretty restricted. Dry forest specialists, we have more of my, my specialty. I've spent a lot of time working on elk deer, which are mostly Myanmar, a little population here in India, and now you've got some in Cambodia. And then chittal, which don't appear to be endangered from the range map. And lastly, sandbar. Sandbar are the one generalist in the group. I put this species up here because there is no way there is that many sandbar in the world. I'm the deer specialist group chairman. I'm the one that makes the maps. This map is horrible. A lot of these maps are horrible. If you want to do a study, if you want to be a researcher, find a way for us to make better range maps for a lot of these species. Experts sitting in a room drawing lines around areas really doesn't work anymore. Especially it works for Species like Barasinga or possibly Elsir, where they're confined to very small areas. But for these generalist species, uh, sandbar are abundant nowhere that I have found them. They're always at low densities and they're, they're very patchily distributed. But when we make a range map, it looks like this. Uh, so something for somebody to work on. So I may not be able to identify uh, dry forests from a satellite, but I know it when I see it. You walk into dry forest, you know you're sitting in dry forest. Grass, that's it, grass. Grass under trees. Sometimes a little more trees, sometimes a little less trees, but grass. You've also got that rainfall criteria. You probably need less than 1,500 millimeters of annual rainfall. You need some sort of monsoon system for the rains, and you need fire. And here are two forests that I walk working in Thailand. They have an extended dry season. Uh, Khao Chong is on the edge of being dry forest. Their dry season is not really quite long enough for there to be abundant grass. But Hoi Ka Kang is perfect for an abundant grass. And they have a five month dry season when there aren't rains above 100 millimeters or any, any month. So um, low tree diversity, annual fires, grass dominated little down woody debris because of the frequency of fires. Uh, there are riparian areas. The riparian areas usually have a lot less grass, a lot moister soil. The fire uh, usually doesn't penetrate into the riparian areas, so they end up being ribbons through that, that forest that are a little bit different, but uh, they're usually there. Uh, I, when I first went into a dry forest, I spent a lot of time looking at the trees. You almost have to ignore the trees. Pay attention to the grass. As far as the animals, the ungulates are concerned, it's the grass. This is a grassland that happens to have trees in it. There's a cycle to, the, to that grassland. Uh, in the early summer, beginning of the rain season, beginning of the monsoons, you've got, you've got vibrant growing grass. December, most of that grass has gone dormant. You have a burning season, and you usually have a re-sprouting season. Toward the end of that, of following those fires, there's a re-sprouting of those grasses in the absence of rain. That re-sprouting is the name of the game. If you can't re-sprout the grass, you can't maintain the ungulate populations through that dry season. They need that re-sprouting, and the re-sprouting just doesn't always happen. It depends on the severity of the fire, the density of the grass, and also the composition of those trees. I know we, I said ignore the trees, but the trees contribute to that fire propagation on that bottom level. Uh, yeah, this is just saying exactly the same thing. Uh, it, it should burn, it should burn off that, that, that dormant and dead debris, and you're gonna get yourself a re-sprout. These dry fires are incredibly important for people. There are a lot of non-forest products that are produced out of this dry forest. I'm not telling you anything that you that you don't already know. It's also relatively abundant for diversity. Or maybe it's not as eye-dropping as a, a tropical rainforest, but you still have a good diversity of, 
of plants, and a lot of endemic plants and animals associated with dry forests. There is a good, healthy dry forest has a high fruit production. That fruit production can support a lot of species, both primates and those ungulates on the forest underneath. And we do have a lot of large ungulates, a lot of large ungulates and carnivores that are associated with these uh, with these dry forests. You know, keep your grass, keep your ungulates, keep your ungulates, you'll keep your predators. That's the system to life. How am I going to look at these ungulate communities? And I'm going to report one thing we've done relatively recently is in order to look at how these ungulates structure themselves inside a dry forest, we decided to look at uh, barcoding using uh, fecal DNA. It's way too much to go into that here in this little talk. Let, us just, let me say, I think it works. I think if you can collect fresh species and you can stop the degradation of those species with, with white-tailed deer in the United States, and we, I'm going to report a little data here from a Thailand study that we just completed. This, you need, if you're going to do a DNA bar coding, you need to have a library. You need to have those DNA for all the species of concern has to be in some sort of database. There is a database out there already. Uh, there's, there's tens of thousands of species in that database. You can look through the database and decide if some of the species you're interested in are missing, collect specimens, add them to the library, it's not that hard. But for the most part, that work's already been done for you. Uh, I'm not a geneticist. I don't know how that works. I know it. I can talk a little bit about it, but not in detail. I'm the guy who collects the feces. So we went to Hoi Ko Kang, which is a uh, dry forest in Thailand in the Western Forest Complex, 2015-2016, collected feces from eight species of ungulates. We, we extracted the DNA from those species, compared it to 273 plant species that we had in our library, and we detected uh, 93 of those species in the feces. I don't know if you think 93 is a lot or a little. Uh, it was an interesting number to me. Uh, what was more interesting to me is I had some real experts from Thailand working with me from uh, Kassasar University, and we created a list of 127 species we thought were going to be consumed by these by these ungulates, and only 37 of them were detected in the feces. And all these plants that we weren't aware of were in the feces. So the diet that the experts thought was not quite the diet that we found in this project. When you get it all done, you end up with something like this. this. This thing goes on and on for pages, but you have a list of the plant species, you have a list of the, the different eight ungulates there, munjack, hog deer, elves deer, wild pig, sandbar, bantang, gower, elephant, and whether that species was detected in the feces or not, how many feces it was detected in, so on and so on. If you make some sort of summary table, this is what it looks like. You know, these ungulates segregate themselves based on size and a little bit on habitat, and we're thinking that somehow they all have unique niches. Uh, for me, what was amazing is uh, the number of plant species found in, 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 in overall for each of these species. They're all eating between uh, 22 and 67 species of plants in a short period of time with a small number of collections. An individual fecal pile sitting on the ground, on average, had nine, eight, nine species of plants in that fecal pile. So it's not like that deer is eating one thing at any one point in time. There's a real mixture of plants in there. And also for all of these species, an emphasis on grass. So in African systems, you have, a, you have animals that are primarily browsers on woody plants, and you have primarily grazers on, on grasses. In this Asian system where we look at, everybody's on the grazer end of the, the spectrum. Grasses and forbs make up a good half, half of that diet. We didn't have any browsers, not elephants, not um, sandbar, or whatever you might have thought of as a, as a browser. They're all 